just as the individual self-consciousness does not find itself in this universal work of absolute freedom, qua existence substance, so little does it find itself in the deeds proper and individual actions of the will of this freedom. Before the universal can perform a deed, it must concentrate itself into the one of individuality and put at the head an individual self-consciousness. For the universal will is only an actual will in a self, which is a one. But thereby, all other individuals are excluded from the entirety of this deed and have only a limited share in it, so that the deed would not be a deed of the actual universal self-consciousness. Universal freedom, therefore, can produce neither a positive work nor a deed. There is left for it only negative action. It is merely the fury of destruction. Paragraph 589 is a very short but I would say pregnant passage. There's, there's a lot going on here as we prepare to move into the terror from absolute freedom. And this has to do with a, a dynamic that, that turns upon the very notion of will. How do we reconcile individual wills as individual wills with each other in some sort of coordinated community in, in a society in something that could be said to have a universal or general will. How is this going to take place? And remember, this now is happening after institutions have been gutted, after the whole realm of faith has been delegitimized, uh, after the, the entire world, not just of the medieval period, but the early modern period has been shaken to its core in absolute freedom, in the, the very consciousness of, of what would be possible for human beings. And, you know, we, we, we often think of the 19th century as the, the great century of, you know, these, these uh, massive social changes and revolutions. But that's also happening within the 18th century as well. So how do we get there? Hegel talks about this, this first of all, individual self-consciousness attempting to find itself. And is it able to do this within this realm of absolute freedom? as conceived in terms of a universal work to which it, it somehow contributes. Now, he talks a little bit more uh, substantively about this absolute freedom. He says, we have absolute freedom qua existent, dasienda, substance, right? A, a substance that actually is there, that, that exists for us, that we can see, that we can participate in institutionally. So he says, individual self-consciousness does not, does not find itself in this universal work. It knows the universal work is there, but it doesn't manage to identify itself with that. Why not? Why is there this alienation, this expropriation of its own effort, its own contributions into this universal work. Why can't it say, well, we all do our part and everybody, you know, thereby participates in this one big happy family or a neighborhood or community or state or pick whatever you like. Hegel tells us here that um, the, it doesn't find itself in that and it also doesn't find itself in the deeds proper and the individual actions of the will of this freedom. So those are interesting things to say, right? The deeds proper, eigentlichen taten. Taten is doing the deeds, that, that makes perfect sense. We can also say actions. Eigentlichen, you know, individual, proper, um, my own, that which belongs to me, as the agent. It's no longer finding itself in that. It's also not finding it in whatever the universal work is doing um, as a response. Individual actions, individual handeln, handlungen, sorry, um, 
Actions, yes. Comportments, yes. Uh, general ways of doing things, that works too. So really anything within the practical sphere, the individual self-consciousness is not able to find itself, is not able to recognize itself, is not able to get its meaning out of this relation where everybody is contributing through their own proper deeds and their own, uh, their own individual deeds and their own individual actions to this greater whole. They're not able to find themselves in the whole, but they're also not able to find themselves in the action that they're doing. Where can they find themselves then? Well, the answer is they can't at this point, but where can they seek to find themselves? So here there's a transition. Hegel says, before the universal can perform a deed, before there can actually be a response on this part of this, you know, as we're calling it, um, in, you know, individual action or eigenlichen Taten, which, which is not going to be just individual, right? If it is, in, in fact, a, a uh, universal work or the work of absolute freedom, before it can do that, he says, it has to concentrate itself into the one of individuality. Now, what the hell does that mean? It has to concentrate itself into the one of individuality. In order for the substance to become subject, in order to have agency, it has to have somebody who it's working through. Now, we've seen this discussed at many points in time, right? We saw this earlier in the spirit section in talking about state power, how state power has to actually be concentrated in whoever is the government, and that can be a, a, a number of people, or that can be one person, or that can be all sorts of things in between. It can involve a bureaucracy of people who are serving the government, who are in some way uh, doing their fair share. It can involve vassalage. It can involve all sorts of things. But there has to be some apex of agency, some place where it's not the buck stops here, but rather the action starts here. And what can the action start with? So Hegel is going to talk about the universal will at this point. The universal will has to be put into motion by some individual will. This is going to be a real problem, and this is a long-standing problem by the time that we get to Hegel in modernity. So he says, in order to perform a deed, it must concentrate itself into the one of individuality and put at the head, put on top, an individual self-consciousness. This raises all sorts of problems, right? So let's talk about one of these problems. This is something that Hobbes, who is totally aware of this and thought that this was, in fact, the best that we could hope for, uh, addresses in Leviathan. He says that when we make a social contract, which we do so as rational agents to get ourselves out of this state of nature where life is nasty, brutish, and short. You know, you can read Leviathan. I don't have to go through all of that. We make a social contract as rational beings. Not entirely rational beings, but rational enough to recognize our own irrationality and the irrationality of that SOB down the street from me who might want to take my stuff or might think me a threat and then try to eliminate me, or might be competing with me just for social prestige, or, you know, as we call it, honor. Hobbes called that the motive of vanity. We form a social contract, which means that each of us willingly renounces some portion of what it is that we desire, or what we might desire in the future. We do so in, so that I, I give in order that you will give to me. I won't attack you, kill you, threaten you, take your stuff. You won't do those things to me. And Hobbes lays out a whole bunch of laws of nature that a rational person ought to be able to understand. But we're not so rational that we will actually follow these if there isn't some authority figure, which he calls the sovereign, in place to enforce them. And Hobbes gets a lot of grief in, in uh, modern philosophy, uh, in, in part because you know, the, the situation as he, as he sets it out is a bit simplified, but also because the solution that he sets in place of the absolute sovereign was not even acceptable to some of the absolute sovereigns of his time. 
In short, the absolute sovereign has complete power over life and death, cannot be opposed legitimately, except you know, to try to preserve your own life, uh, and, and that's within very, very narrow limits, um, gets to decide what all the other laws are, gets to decide who the magistrates are, gets to decide what the foreign policy is, gets to decide who can teach what when it comes to social theory. So we're talking about not just political control, but intellectual control as well. Also, it extends to religion, too, should mention. Now, why would we want something like that? Because Hobbes says, listen, otherwise you're just going to have some arbitrary despot. It's only when you associate in this way and you have somebody at the apex who genuinely is a sovereign that you have something like a universal will. Now, other people see that and they say, that person still is a despot. <laughs> Why did you pick, you know, this, this guy over here, George, to run things and not Fred or, you know, uh, uh, Henrietta or whoever else you want to, to select? Why, why this one person and not a democracy? Or at least an aristocracy of sorts. Hobbes thinks that there's a natural logic that leads to having that sort of one. Jean-Jacques Rousseau also talks about the general will. Very critical of Hobbes, but he also has a general will that in certain respects goes beyond the Hobbesian one, saying that it has to force us to be free. Now, again, we can have this sort of, well, why that group and their arbitrary choice, their arbitrary power? Why does the magistrate get to decide things in this case for us in a way that is going to contravene our own individual will? That doesn't seem to be uh, actually contributing to, the, to a general or universal work, but just expropri expropriating it and using it for, for its own whims. Now, this is a big problem, isn't it, in absolute monarchies? So he says, um, the universal will is only an, an, act, an actual will, a, a will that can decide things in a self, in a one. You've got to have somebody who's in charge. There's no way around it. And he says, thereby, this is a big problem, all other individuals are excluded from the entirety of this deed, and they only have a limited share in it, so that the deed would not be a deed of the actual universal self-consciousness. So what this means, he says, universal freedom can produce neither a positive work nor a deed. This turns out to be a pipe dream. There is no universal work that I can find myself in. There is left for it only negative action. He says it's merely the fury of destruction. So now we're starting to see the, the slide from absolute freedom, which sounded so good, had to happen in some kind of harmony, down into the terror. But the supreme reality and the reality which stands in the greatest antithesis to universal freedom, or rather the sole object that will still exist for that freedom, is the freedom and individuality of actual self-consciousness itself. For that universality which does not let itself advance to the reality of an organic articulation and whose aim is to maintain itself in an unbroken continuity at the same time creates a distinction within itself because it is movement or consciousness in general. And moreover, by virtue of its own abstraction, it divides itself into extremes equally abstract, into a simple, inflexible, cold universality and into the discrete, absolute, hard rigidity and self-willed atomism of actual self-consciousness. Now that it has completed the destruction of the actual organization of the world and exists now just for itself, this is its sole object, an object that no longer has any content, possession, existence, or outer extension, but is merely this knowledge of itself as an absolutely pure and free individual self. All that remains of the object by which it can be laid hold of is solely its abstract existence as such. The relation then of these two, since each exists indivisibly and absolutely for itself, and thus cannot dispose of a middle term which would link them together, is one of wholly unmediated pure negation, a negation, moreover, of the individual as being existing in the universal. The sole work indeed of universal freedom is therefore death, a death too which has no inner significance or filling, 
For what is negated is the empty point of the absolutely free self. It is thus the coldest and meanest of all deaths, which no more, with no more significance than cutting off a head of cabbage or swallowing a mouthful of water. Paragraph 590 ends in a terrible way, which makes perfect sense given that the entire title and the content of this is absolute freedom and terror. What, what is terror and what is terrible? So he's going to talk about death, but he doesn't just talk about any sort of death. He's going to end by saying we have a death which has no inner significance or filling. What is negated is the empty point of the absolutely free self. It is the coldest and meanest of all deaths, which with no more significance than cutting off a head of cabbage or swallowing a mouthful of water. A death that has no significance both for the person who's dying and for the per person who is imposing death or even the one who is commanding it in some way. It becomes something to tick off a box on a form. So how do we get there? Well, remember in the last paragraph, we found that the individual self-consciousness could not find itself within the universal work. And at the same time, one person was being elevated to embody the universal will by the very nature of the way will has to work. So he says the supreme reality and the reality which stands in the greatest antithesis to universal freedom, or rather the sole object that will still exist for that freedom, is what? The freedom and individuality of actual self-consciousness itself. It's a convoluted little line, right? So we've got this universal freedom and something is standing in antithesis to it. But is also, he says, the sole object that will exist for it. What, what can be on its radar, so to speak? The absolute freedom. The absolute freedom enjoyed by the, the ruler. We have this antithesis, as he's saying at first, although it's not going to turn out to be the normal kind of antithesis set up between the universal will and work, which is uh, being steered, dominated, expropriated by the one individual, the person who really does enjoy absolute freedom, and then the individual self-consciousness. And there, there are many of these, right? But each one presents a sort of threat insofar as they're not integrated, not just within into the apparatus of society, but into the desires, into the plans of that one individual. And this is unfair. And, and clearly these individuals sense that. And, and you can say, well, you know, working for the greater good, our, our leader is so brilliant and, you know, prescient and taking care of us. And yet there's still that, that part in us that's like, Screw them. They don't know what, what it's like to live here as a peasant or, you know, to work in the factory or to be a soldier in their army or to be, you know, doing the wash or pick whatever you like. They don't understand our actual position. There's a legitimate concern there. So he goes on and he says, that universality, which does not let itself advance to the reality of an organic articulation. Now, why? Why does this, this not allow itself to advance, as he says, to an organic articulation? What would an organic articulation be? Uh, something more like the state as Hegel ultimately envisions it, envisions it later on um, as, uh, you know, a place where everybody, every role has its, its particular contribution to make and understands itself as being part of a greater whole. Now that's more of an ideal than an actuality, although we do enjoy things like that sometimes, although oftentimes we think that we're, we're that way and then we find somebody behind the scenes getting the glory, getting the money, getting the credit, bossing us around, doing what they want with it. Uh, many people uh, in today's corporate environment uh, 
find themselves getting screwed over uh, by identifying themselves with an organization or an institution, thinking that that, uh, you know, doing their little part in there is actually honored, rewarded, and will be taken care of later on, only to discover that they are totally expendable and the boss doesn't even really know their name. So let's go on with this, right? He says, um, it doesn't let itself advance to the reality of an organic articulation. Its aim is to maintain itself in an unbroken continuity, but it creates a distinction within itself. Hegelian logic here, right? Because it is movement or consciousness in general. By virtue of its own abstraction, he says, it divides itself into extremes equally abstract. Notice what he's saying there. Equally abstract extremes. The, the general universal will, the governance, um, the one who's in charge, abstract, sort of like the Lord of the world earlier. The individual self-consciousness, we would say, well, that's the most concrete you can get. Well, it can also be abstract. He talks about atomized individuals here. That is, people who understand themselves as isolated, as apart from everybody else. Now, that goes against the very notion of self-consciousness that we saw early on in the self-consciousness section. Self-consciousness only is in relation to an other, and this doesn't have to be the only other. It could be the other who is your, your parent, your child, uh, the person down the street. Self-consciousness really exists in relation to other others. But insofar as it's just a sort of, I'm not going to be told what to do reaction over here, it is abstract. So he says, we have an inflexible, cold universality, and then the discrete, absolute, hard rigidity and self-willed atomism of actual self-consciousness. Now here's where things get trickier, where the stakes are raised. Hegel talks about the destroyed actual organization of the world. Before, if we had this sort of conflict, we could fall back on a world of culture or a world of faith or perhaps even a world of the early Enlightenment. But all of that through the, the corrosive critique of the Enlightenment has been delegitimized. We can no longer fall back on that. We're entering a new era where absolute freedom could be realized. Absolute freedom means none of these institutions and organizations and ways of establishing society have complete call uh, upon us. They're, they don't provide us with a place to retreat. So he says, um, now that it has completed the destruction of the actual organization of the world and exists now just for itself, this is its sole object. Who's the it there? Self-consciousness, right? Or absolute freedom. An object that no longer has any content, possession, existence, or outer extension, but is merely this knowledge of itself as an absolutely pure and free individual self. So he says, all that remains are the object by which it can be laid hold of. Object for what? what? What object are we talking about? Like money or guns or butter? No, the object is self-consciousness. The object is freedom. What the hell is freedom? What, what does this mean to me? I can understand it in another person. But that other person is being treated abstractly. Very abstractly. We might call this hyper-abstraction. So Hegel is telling us that for each person involved in this, the other person, the other other, becomes simply an abstract S existence as such. What does this give us then? He says the relation of these two, since each exists indivisibly and absolutely for itself, the one who is in charge and the one who is not in charge, who has to take the orders, we don't have the same sort of relation as we did, say, in the master-slave dialectic. Instead, he says, um, the relation cannot dispose of a middle term which would link them together. There is no mediation here. Instead, there's just negation. Negation coming from both sides. So he says, it's unmediated, pure negation, a negation of the individual as a being existing in the universal. How is this a negation of the being 
the individual existing in the universal. Well, if you kill the one in charge, or if you also say, well, you're not really a person anymore, that's a negation of the individual existing in the universal. There's also a negation of the individual existing in the universal insofar as the action, the comportment, whatever it is that this contribution is supposed to mean, doesn't really uh, provide them with anything. But there's another way, too, in which the universal here can negate the individual, and that is through death. He says, the sole work indeed of universal freedom is death. And this is a, a death that no longer has some sort of locus of meaning. It's just a wiping things out, a settling scores. It's a bureaucratic death, we might say. So are we yet at the terror? Not yet, but we're getting very close. 